what is global health? That is a question that my colleagues and myself have asked for the last 20 years. And the final answer to that question emerged as something we call Ibrika, or Ustawi Biomedical Research Innovation and Industrial Centers of Africa. Why is global health so important? <coughs> it's important to you because Uncle Sam, for the last 10 years, has spent $1 trillion on global health. And even as Uncle Sam is spending so much money, women continue to die, particularly in Africa, just because they become pregnant. Pregnancy in Africa is a death sentence to many women. <clears throat> and even when the child is born, the chance of this child surviving beyond one year is very limited. One out of every healthy 10 babies born in Africa is going to die before the age of one year. Mothers have to resort to techniques like applying shoe polish to prevent their babies uh, from dying, to protect their babies from dying. And even those who survive one year, there is no guarantee that they are going to live beyond age 50. So we're losing so many people as we are spending so much money on global health. And the idea of global health is very elusive. We can't seem to find the answer. Some people think or say that global health is diseases traversing national boundaries. So we have made it our duty to create quarantine on national borders to prevent people from crossing the boundaries in case they brought disease to us. <clears throat> Some people have conceived global health as travel medicine or international health or something that re relates to that. Others have conceived global health as donating mosquito nets to people in African villages or even donating condoms to protect people from HIV and such activities. So this has brought a lot of confusion and this confusion is arising because we don't really know what is global health. When you look at this question really deeply, we thought that global health is not about all these things, not about people traveling, not about national boundaries, but it's about our ability to, br to produce health in every one of us on this planet. Okay. Then we encountered another problem. <clears throat> global health is just a name, a name that is a metaphysical name that points to what? We know that <clears throat> human beings know things by their physical nature. For example, if you look at the image right here, you can tell it's a potato. It's a potato because it has got physical features, something that you know is tangible. And what if I was to tell you it was a carrot? <laughs> what would you say? Well, you're pulling my leg, you know, because I can tell that's not a carrot. So it turns out that in, we, uh, in order for us to know something, we need to know its physical nature. And so we ask ourselves, what are the physical features of global health? That was the question. And then, before we could even figure out the physical features, before you, figure, before you can figure out the physical features of a thing, you have to think about how the thing functions. So we said, this thing has to produce health of humans, okay? So that health of human is in. It has also to produce health of animals. Why? Because animals contribute 85% of all infectious diseases incident to human, including nearly all the diseases that end up becoming global pandemics, like Ebola, they come from animals. Then <clears throat> the environment where people live, clean water, sanitation, pollution, also co all contribute to the health outcomes of a human. But then there was one more important thing that people seem to forget, money. When you don't have money, all the diseases will come to you. So when we look closely at those four elements, we found that two things are in operation here. This one health theory that recognizes that in order for us to produce health in humans, we have to think about the animals and the environment where the, the humans live. And we call that one health. And for the last 20 years or so, people have been working on one health theory. But then on the other hand, there is sustainability theory that seems to argue that in order for us to be sustainable society, we have to think about the health of the humans, the health of <coughs> the economy, the pocket, and the health of the environment itself. These two theories seem to be operating at two different energy levels. And each one excluding one thing from the other. The sustainability theory excluding the animal, and the one health theory excluding the economy. It seems like there's a creative tension between the two that we need to resolve in order for us to achieve global health. And so now we have the two elements, but when you look at them much closely, we found that the four elements do not have equal weight in terms of the 
economic development is by far the greatest cause of improvement in health. And then it looks like economic development or having money is a cornerstone of creating sustainable health, sustainable one health. That means that economy ties all the elements together and becomes the fourth element. So we said, now we understand the functional features of global health. How would it look like physically? We said it, it has to have a clinic, a One Health clinic. But then how do we build the economic development, which is the cornerstone? We have to have a retail system that purchases things that people produce in every village. But purchasing what? Things have to be improved in quality. Things like eggs. People in the village produce potatoes. They have goats that have like it to produce milk, like it to produce skin, like it to produce things. But you cannot just sell the skin of a goat, you need to improve it. So we build workshops in that retail system that can help to improve the quality of those things. And so we have an economic driver that is driving the one health. And together, managed by a cooperative society of members who belong to that village, and we call that the operational unit of global health. So now we have a body of global health. So we took this opportunity to work with our colleagues at the College of Architecture at Texas A&M and asked them, could you design for us the body of global health? And this is the model that came out. You can see on one side on this image, <coughs> you, your right side is the, the clinic right there. And then it has a retail store in the middle surrounded by workshop. You can have a food cooperative workshop. You have leather cooperative workshop. You have wood workshop, metal workshop. And you can put this in any village you want. And so we said, now we have a body of global health. And we give the name of that body of global health, the Bricker Retail Clinical Center, or URCC. Then we knew something else is a food, <coughs> that when you have a body, like my own body, it's not just a body. It has the ability to detect the changes in the environment. How do, how do I detect changes in the environment? Because I extend myself to the environment in which I live. Now, <coughs> in order for us to build the extension of this, we employ four kinds of community workers. Community health, community health worker, a community economic worker, and community social worker, and another community worker just to manage the whole process. So the community health worker is somebody who is going to collect information about diseases and health that happen to every family with the ability to detect diseases before they can leave the family. The community economic development worker helps to tell the mothers and the fathers in that village that there's opportunity for you to sell sheep in our cooperative society. And of course, getting people to become members of that cooperative so that we are all in one unit. And we arm this community health worker with a software application on a smart, smart device, like a smartphone, that can detect social data, health data, economic data, and then we can collect all that data and transmit it to a central location. So we are talking here about a smart body. We can, for the first time, we can build common sense into global health. So we have global health that is intelligent. It's able to detect data. For if we had this system, uh, Ebola would not have left West Africa to travel all the way to United States to come and, keep, uh, and cause trouble in the, in, the, in the United States. So we say, how do we distribute this? In Kenya, we propose to build a full network of these retail clinical centers distributed peripherally in the country and connected to a central site, which now would be the brain, on 4,000 acres where we have advanced biomedical research facilities that we, we would be using this data that is being translated and then connected horizontally to one another so that these retail facilities that are in each body of global health are able to create a common market for themselves. And so, to resolve the human resource problem, we know that Africa loses 68% of the people, train the, the physicians trained in Africa, end up leaving the continent because they cannot get good jobs. And Kenya alone loses about 55% of their doctors every year. What if we offered these doctors a franchise to own this unit that can be put in every village and tell, we're gonna support you financially, match you with financing, just, just the same way we do mortgage investment we, we get a mortgage, you build this in your village, you'll be paying slowly over many years with a whole economic model built around it. Then we can create a, a distributed franchise of sustainable One Health communities all over the world. So 
we are saying that we produce global health by building sustainable one health community. You've seen economic development is by far the greatest uh, cause of improvement in health. So today, we, let us <coughs> gonna call to action, let us put sustainable one health communities in every village on this planet. And by doing so, we shall achieve global health. Thank you so much.